Hi and welcome to FreeDU Hub. Today we are starting a new course on the cloud computing. It's a very basic course covering the basic aspects of cloud computing. So after completing this course, you'll be able to understand the basic infrastructure of a cloud, how it works, and what are the basic things which are required or the technologies that you should be aware of when you talk about cloud computing. Now we'll have series of lectures. This is one of the lectures where we are starting to understand the cloud and what are the basic utilizations of a cloud. Now, first of all, we can see that cloud is everywhere. Uh, wherever we are using any information technology or any services online or the applications that we are using, we can see different instances of cloud computing everywhere. Now, if we talk about web hosting, we can see, um, get an example of a startup lease cloud facilities for its website. The company can pay for additional facilities as the website traffic grows. So you're hosting your website with a cloud service provider. It would provide you a space and it would provide you the domain name where you'll be hosting your things in the hosting package of the website. Now, if the traffic is growing on your website, you can simply ask them to increase the capacity or the server details or the specifications of it so that you can easily meet the requirements of the customers which are constantly coming on your website. Now, it is also there in Internet of Things as well. For example, an individual uses a smartphone to check Internet of Things devices at their residence. Uh, BNB is an example of that, that uh, um, the persons who are owning those properties, um, they can lock and unlock the doors using the technology which is based on IoT. Then we have web-based softwares. Uh, for example, an enterprise company leases the facilities and software for business functions such as payroll, accounting, billing, and lots of other things. Um, we can give an example of Salesforce, Office 365, Google Drive, or OneDrive, etc., where we are not purchasing these products as a product to be installed on our devices. Rather, they are hosted somewhere. You are getting a subscription for those services and you'll be able to utilize it completely as if you are owning it. It is a multi-tenancy uh, device or the setup of it where you'll pay for the subscription and you'll be able to see uh, the employees or the, um, or the staff that you have in your organization who are using those services and it would be available to only persons within your organization. Then we have an excellent example of web-based collaboration. An enterprise company leases its facilities and software for business functions such as payroll and accounting and billing, etc. We have already covered. Now coming to the web-based collaboration, for example, students are working on a team project, uses a browser to edit and they share documents, etc. We have seen uh, Google Sheets, for example. Um, if we are using uh, their cloud-based service, multiple users can work together um, on a Excel sheet and they can edit the thing simultaneously. So uh, that's an example of it. Further, if we'll think of uh, um, the other softwares like Zoom, etc., uh, we are using it in benefit of uh, um, communicating with the external entities and to conduct different meetings online. Now, it is also applicable in the medical equipment. For example, a patient wears a medical device that periodically uploads readings for analysis. Their doctor is alerted if a medical problem is detected. So they don't need to inform the doctors. They are very much linked with these technologies and getting the updated uh, feedback of the uh, health conditions of the patients. Now there is an option of scalability. A seasonal company leases the computer facilities during the four peak months of each year. The company doesn't pay for the facilities um, at other times. So if the requirements are increasing, it would automatically scale up to cater the needs of the customers. Uh, we gave an example about the student registration period. During the registration period, there is a high load on the server. So instead of buying the new servers 
in a conventional data center environment, you will move your services to the cloud where you will uh, utilize the services at a lower tier. But during the registration period, you will ask them to scale up the resources so that you can easily accommodate all the students who are trying to register the courses at the same time. And once the period is over, it would scale down itself to the original position. So you will be paying for the time period for which you utilize the resources uh, during the registration period. Now we can see lots of uh, uh, use of social media. Now all these services like Facebook, Twitter, etc. They are all cloud based services where we love sharing our uh, family moments and uh, the pictures that you want to share with the public are uploaded on social media, which is accessible by everyone. Then we have data analytics and data mining. A retail company, for example, leases the facilities at the end of the physical year to run data analytics software that utilizes the sales of the year. So they are using the specialized services in order to get the deep analysis of the data that they have in order to come up or to make the informed decisions for the futuristic plans or the marketing campaigns that um, they could have. Then we have Netflix, Amazon Prime, and IPTV, etc. An individual uses streaming services to watch a movie. A copy of a movie is kept in a facility near the family's residence or maybe in the cloud by these service providers. Um, you remember uh, there was a time when there were normal antennas on the rooftops. Then the time came when we had those dish antennas. And nowadays we are using these services which are IP based like Netflix, Amazon and IPTV, etc. Where we can utilize all these services uh, by subscribing to them and we can enjoy all the channels at a um, high definition quality. Uh, then it is also helping us in the supply chain. Uh, for example, the recipient of a package uses a tracking number to learn about the current location of the package and the expected time of delivery. That's why Whenever they are delivering an item, immediately as soon as the item is delivered at your doorstep, you'll receive a message that the item has been delivered because the person who's delivering the items at your doorstep, he immediately updates it in the system and you receive the confirmation that the item has been successfully delivered. So that means that all the companies, whether they are small or big, they are thinking or if they are using uh, the local facilities for different things like payroll and HR, etc., they are also thinking to move uh, their facilities to the Internet. Uh, so that is becoming really successful and powerful these days where uh, we can see a huge utilization of cloud based services at the moment. Now, just to give you another example before we can move to the next slide is that we know that there are battery operated IoT or sensor devices that are used uh, to monitor the civil infrastructure such as bridges, etc. A set of sensors on a bridge periodically measures the vibrations and stress and the uploads the data to the cloud. Now, the software running in the cloud data center combines the measurements from the dozens of sensors and assesses the safety of the bridge. Um, that's the amount of the processing needs for the uh, such computationals uh, far exceeds the capability of the battery operated sensors but at the same time they are collecting all these details with the help of which they can provide periodic maintenance or the preventive maintenance of all those bridges so that uh, we have a safe and secure environment outside. Now we have the uh, thing that we call facilities for a flexible computing. And for that, we have software as a service, platform as a service, and infrastructure as a service. And then we have lots of other things, for example, on-demand services, resource pooling, um, uh, broad network access, and the rapid elasticity and major services. So these are some of the uh, key components of a cloud computing and an infrastructure. But we'll be talking about infrastructure as a service later. At the moment, we'll try to understand just like we can expand the uh, resources utilization of the server or the machines that we are using in order to host our services or applications. Uh, likewise, there are scalable storage that when you need the storage or you need the higher capacity of the storage, you can even utilize the cloud-based storage services. Now, the best benefit of this is that it is 100% secure. First of all, only you'll have access to your data. 
the other thing is that there are excellent backups of the storage which is available in the cloud so they are maintaining multiple instances of the data in the cloud um, for example if you'll uh, choose your two locations uh, and your service uh, you are um, trying to get a service with Amazon cloud services it would ask you to choose a service maybe for example in Mid Middle East and somewhere in Africa so uh, you'll have two different instances of the storage and it would keep or maintain the backup at two different locations so if somehow uh, the location is having any issues in the Middle East it would automatically switch and would provide the services from the African uh, data centers which are hosted over there now uh, that's also talking about the incremental growth of it first of all it's best for small businesses with gradual growth which are growing with the passage of time and then it's a best software licensing with no support issue so if you are using Microsoft Windows for licensing etc it would be uh, hosted all the licenses would be hosted on a KMS server uh, through which they are um, activating all the client machines and it is also a cloud-based solution where uh, Microsoft is linked to the um, uh, key management server on-premises and is serving and management of the keys uh, within an organization so it is supporting the small businesses and the big ones we can say that this startup can begin by leasing minimum software for example hosting a website payment payment processing etc online and can add a database accounting software later to it uh, the cloud provider will be able to satisfy the computing needs even if the startup grows in a substantial enterprise business later then we have a cyclic demand it means that uh, you can pay as you go you'll pay for the services till the time you are utilizing that higher tier of services or the resources utilization from a cloud service provider so the cloud computing allows each customer to increase or decrease their use of cloud facilities at any time a customer only pays for the facilities they are utilizing now that's the start of cloud let's let's try to understand that what were the problems and how we evolved gradually to the cloud so in 1980s and 90s chip manufacturers produced a series of processors that had more functionality and higher speed than the previous ones as a consequence individual computers became more powerful each other while the cost remained approximately the same the availability of a powerful low cost computational facilities encouraged both individuals and organizations to expand their use of computers at the same time if the processing power of the computer became insufficient for the workload the computer could easily be upgraded to a newer more powerful model in particular to offer internal and external services such as World Wide Web services or organization could run the software on a powerful computer known as a server when demand for the particular service became high the organization could replace the server being used by uh, the model that uh, had a faster processor and a more memory so when we talk about a power wall the, that's the uh, uh, bottleneck that the industry faced in 1990s uh, by late 1990s the chip manufacturer faced a serious limitation where um, uh, we could not provide uh, more services or more computational pro um, power by a single chip each transistor consumed a small amount of power and emits a small amount of heat when billions of transistors were squeezed together in a small space the temperature um, could climb very high because it requires computational power more important uh, the uh, the amount of the power consumed is uh, therefore really high so the temperature of the chip will also go high whereas on the other hand a small increase in the clock sp uh, clock speed of the cpu uh, it increased the temperature significantly thus the manufacturers eventually reached a critical point uh, and the processor speed could not be increased beyond the gigahertz without generating so much heat that the chip would burn out industry uses a term called power wall to um, characterize the limit uh, in the or the processing speed of the processor itself so they came up with the solution that a multi-core processor would use uh, 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 multiple processors in it so that would solve the problem partially now this concept is called parallelism where the multiple processors uh, can operate at a speed below the power wall instead of one processor that operates at the same high speed now to handle the situation chip manufacturers um, devise two uh, chips that uh, contain multiple copies of the processor which we call as cores each core consists of 
complete processor that operates at the safe speed and the software must devise a way to use multiple cores to perform the computations. Now the industry uses a term called multi-core processor to describe a chip with multiple processors. A dual core processor contains two processors as the name indicates, a quad core processor contains four and so on. So the multi-core processor from one of the fundamental building blocks for the cloud computing package. Now unlikely the processors used and consumes the product. However, the multi-core processor use the cloud systems which have many cores, for example, 64 or 128. A later chapter examines the virtualization of the software and explains how the cloud and the computer use multiple cores for virtualization. So we can see that on our hosts which we, call, which we use for virtualization, a host is a computer which is used for virtualization. It usually have lots of cores and threads in order to handle heavy computational power of these computers. Now we have from multiple cores to multiple machines. Now here we had the problem that although uh, they offer increased processing power on a chip, multiple cores do not solve the problem um, at all. The cores on a chip um, all share underlying the memory with the input and output access. Unfortunately, the number of cores increases. The input and output memory access becomes the bottleneck. So then the concept of supercomputers came. Uh, the supercomputer was there, but it was quite expensive uh, for the universities and laboratories. So they, they could only own it because it was quite expensive at that time. It still is expensive, uh, but at that time, as compared to the individual processing power of a computer, it was very expensive uh, to do the calculations altogether. So what universities and laboratories did um, on a small uh, scale, they purchased multiple uh, supercomputers to combine the processing power of it. However, the personal computers had become a commodity items as reflected in their low price. Despite of the uh, drop in the price, personal computers had also become more powerful. So the scientists wondered if instead of using expensive computers, now, as explained, um, uh, supercomputers were expensive, so they decided that um, let's have uh, inexpensive personal computers combined together and uh, we can get an output from there. Now, combining these multiple home PCs, we call it as a cluster architecture as well. That helped us in increasing the processing power incremental, um, incrementally by adding inexpensive commodities or the computers together uh, to get the output from these computers. But, they, but that thing came with a challenge as well. We call it a software challenge. A calculation must be divided into pieces so that each piece can be handled by one of the smaller computers in a cluster. Although the approach does not work well in some cases, the science um, of the community uh, found that uh, uh, the way they are using a cluster for many of its important computational problems, thus the cluster architecture becomes accepted as a best way to build affordable grid um, where they can uh, get the same output from the computers as they were doing it in a su supercomputer. So they came up with a thing like sequential applications will be there and parallel applications. They are working in a programming environment. Uh, so there was a cluster middleware which was collecting the output from all those different computers and presenting an output using um, the cluster middleware. Now we have uh, cluster websites to load balancers. Now here, the first challenge was that if a website is hosted somewhere, it's having a lots of traffic, lots of people are coming on that. So how to channelize the traffic so that everyone who is accessing a certain service is able to uh, get the things on time um, and there is no delays in that. Of course, if there is a delay, people are not able to browse the items or they are processing um, uh, time for the credit cards or the payments is taking way 
way too long and sometimes it fails uh, it gives a very negative impact to the customer so they came up with an idea of a load balancer now load balancer solved the huge traffic issues on the services um, the function of a load balancer is to balance the traffic or the load among the servers now we can see that lots of people are accessing the social media platforms or different services like facebook twitter etc so they are working fine like no one is facing any uh, speed issues or the uh, bottlenecks where they are not able to access the services or there is delay in the services though we know that millions of users are utilizing the same service they are using the load balancers in order to channelize or in order to balance the traffic now load balancer technology ensures that all communication from a given customer goes to the same server so it is maintaining the details of that customer and uh, um, in the meantime it is balancing the traffic which goes on each server as well now load balancer distributes equal traffic to all servers without uh, and to avoid the uh, bottlenecks now for example if 10 requests came all together uh, it would distribute the traffic between the number of servers that you have so that each server would be utilized separately and would have equal number of traffic on it when you distribute the traffic on the machines it would process fast and all the customers would get an excellent response on that and we know that eventually they are reaching the same database in order to uh, avail the services over there now we have rack servers or rack of server computers etc since the computers were now powerful all departments were maintaining their own servers in different offices for example hr was keeping their own servers payroll would have its own servers so they decided that let's have a centralized place where uh, we can store all these servers together it would save a lot of uh, money it would save us from different uh, uh, cooling mechanisms for it for backups for security uh, for centralized power for centralized networking backups and all those things so the concept of the um, rack servers were introduced at this time so store in order to store all of these servers in a secure environment racks were in introduced as you can see in this one now uh, these racks uh, um, had different uh, rails inside on which we can easily rest the servers and uh, they'll be connected at the back end with the power and the networking equipment as well. Before that, we were using these racks for the telephone or the um, IP telephones, etc., for the normal telephone conventions, etc., that we were using the PBX exchanges, etc. But since it was very well organized over there, they came up with the same idea that we can host um, the rack servers in that as well. Now, full size rack is approximately six and um, uh, six and maybe one half feet tall, uh, two feet wide, and a three and a uh, one or a half feet deep. Uh, now, the rack contains metal mounting bars. We call it rails on which the equipment can be attached. Now, server computers can be stacked vertically in a rack. A full rack contains 42 units of space, uh, where one unit is uh, of 1.752 inches. A server is designed to be uh, one unit, or we can call it as 1U. So, in principle, uh, one could stack 42 1U servers in each rack. So we can utilize the servers and we can buy them according to their space and then we leave some space in the cabinet itself to for the air to flow easily for the heat dissipation and of course if we want to install a switch over there for networking equipment that would require certain space as well. Now we are talking about economic motivation of centralized data centers. Now we can see these are the typical data centers that uh, uh, we have in different organization. It requires specialized cooling, backup, moisture control, dust control, cooling, dissipation, then fire alarm system, surveillance cameras, uh, temperature sensors, and all those different things. Then you'll have to keep an eye on the overall health of the uh, servers and the storage, uh, which can be centrally controlled using the web-based applications, or physically, um, if the uh, 
um, a person who is responsible for the data center operations is keeping an eye on the overall functionality of it. Now, since they centralized the data center at a place, uh, uh, it was very well maintained uh, for the power, for backup, and rest of the things. Uh, but the problem arised at that time was that you need a high management cost for that. If you need to upgrade uh, all the servers in this one, you'll have to pay a hefty amount for that. Um, then the backups, uh, you'll have uh, to have a huge storage for that. You'll have to have a huge power supply and then cooling to cool down the data center, then the security of it and expertise. So the challenge was that there were uh, a limited number of experienced people available out there and even if they are maintaining a data center within an organization they'll have to um, pay a lot of money in running the cost uh, um, the running cost for that is usually high when they are maintaining these data centers of course you need administrators separate security analyst uh, um, then you need the uh, database administrators you need the um, application server administrators who are taking care of all the applications and everything which is hosted on it. On the other hand, if we are talking about lowering the capital expense of it, we can outsource all of these services to be hosted somewhere in the cloud where a third party or the cloud service provider will be totally responsible uh, for the safety and security and backup and power and location and relocation and um, upgrade of the servers, uh, utilization of the resources and all those things. And in terms of that, you are paying a minimum amount just to utilize a part of their services which they are providing. Now, when they are providing all these services through the cloud, you have excellent web-based interfaces through which uh, you can check the overall utilization of your servers, the security impact, the compliance requirements, and all those different things uh, which can be easily managed over there. Now we'll see the origin of the term cloud. Cloud represents a set of networks and equipment that are interconnected or they are interconnected through the internet or through the networks. Now the data center in the cloud is just a metaphor. It's a technically wrong because servers in a data center are not part of the internet. Maybe if you have a cloud of your own, which is hosted within your organization uh, and it's not connected to the internet but is used for the people within that organization is also called a cloud. So uh, all the technically inaccurate the phrase in the cloud arose because early data centers were located close to networking equipment at the internet peering points rather than in separate buildings. Uh, so we can see that we have lots of things in the cloud, for example, servers, virtual desktops, software platforms, application storage, etc. Um, they are all connected or we are accessing it through the internet. Uh, you might have a router or a switch and the other devices in the organization, for example, desktop computers, printers, or laptops etc will be there with the help of which we can access all those services. Now we have a concept of centralization once again. Now they're saying that for decades the low cost of the computer encouraged the decentralization, the power wall and the cost of the IT staffing favors a return uh, to a centralized model that consolidates the computing facilities into the cloud-based data centers. And that brings us to the end of this chapter where we are talking about uh, the basics or the motivations which were there behind a cloud. So that's it for today. Uh, we'll be covering rest of the things in our future lectures. Thank you very much.